As you open to Romans chapter 5 in your Bibles, what I'm doing, and, and, and for all of you, in my heart, what I pray is that this be a one-on-one -on -one setting, uh, that, that it be like I was sitting with you, only instead of me, let's just change a little bit and say that by the power of the Holy Spirit, I, I pray that this lesson on what God has designed. Now, the scriptures tell us, in the fifth verse, if you want to get ahead, everybody likes to get ahead in America, you know. The fifth verse says that everything I'm talking about is by the Holy Spirit that overflows into our hearts. So God designed the most amazing operating system in the universe. And that operating system, if, if I was to shorten this down to, you know, the little uh, thumbnail, you know, the little writing under pictures you see on the internet so you know what the picture is about, the picture this morning is the operating system that God built into us is the Holy Spirit. And we need to know what God, through his Spirit, wants to accomplish. And so my question to you is, how well is this operating system of the Holy Spirit working in your life? See, that's, that's what all of us, that's what discipleship is about. In fact, yesterday, uh, Bonnie and I were sitting, uh, in fact, it was one of the most perfect examples of the American transportation system. I mean, we, we left uh, Oklahoma at 1230. We were in Kalamazoo at 430. I mean, isn't that, and we flew twice. Isn't it unbelievable that they can do that and everything connected and everything? So we were sitting in Chicago um, on one of those little noisy airplanes that uh, get better gas mileage and hurt your hearing. And uh, we were sitting there, and, and Bonnie was working on, on uh, First Kings and Solomon becoming king, and, and I was doing my pneumatology of Romans and enjoying every minute of it, but all of a sudden, I got distracted because I could hear this couple behind me talking, and, and this is what they said. Hey, I found out if you swipe up like that, there's a flashlight. Oh, really? Let me see it. How did you do that? Does mine have one? Oh, I have a flashlight too. What else does it do? What were they doing? They had just gotten an, a smartphone. And the one had learned one part of the operating system, the functionality of that phone. And it was just as natural as can be for them to show their flashlight to their friend. And for the rest of the time, I, I just so enjoyed. That was one of the most incredible discipleship sessions I've ever heard. Now, now think for a minute. They were, they were helping each other to understand something that was so much bigger than they realized, and they had discovered a facet, and they learned it, and they were able to operate it, and it was working, and they, were, they knew just enough to show someone else how to do it. Helping others understand how things work is so much normal in our lives. We don't think it's abnormal. Now, I'm almost sure. I did finally, I, I said, excuse me, honey, I'm gonna go to the back of the airplane. She thought I was going to the restroom. I actually wanted to look at these people because it enchanted me. I wanted to watch them work. I can assure you after looking at them that neither one of them have been to Chengdu, China. That's where they assemble these things by the millions. Neither one of them, I'm almost sure, have been to Mountain View, California, to the new multi-billion dollar Apple headquarters, which, by the way, Bloomberg said yesterday that Apple might become the first trillion dollar capitalized corporation in the history of the world. They're at 663 and a half billion right now, which is far more than the entire Russian stock exchange and many others combined. In fact, almost all the global stock exchanges from about place 20 down. Apple is bigger than all the rest of the capitalized value of all the other stocks of the world in the bottom sector. But I can assure you, probably they haven't even been to the genius bar at the Apple store. They learned their swipe up flashlight thing by just wanting to and, and trying everything. And it was absolutely, I mean, they didn't feel like they had to graduate from Chengdu or Mountain View or Genius Bar to share with someone else how something worked because they knew it worked, they had tried it, and they could do it and show it. Did you know that's what, what discipleship is all about? Discipleship is communicating to other people what you understand 
about God. And the measure of your spiritual life, your spiritual growth, your spiritual maturity, your connection to God is what you personally understand. And nobody thinks you have to go back to Jerusalem 2,000 years ago to follow Christ around so you can disciple, or go back and rub shoulders with the Apostle Paul and watch him for a few years so you can disciple. Just like those elderly phone discoverers never thought of China or Mountain View. They just knew what, what they had experienced. And they just wanted to share it. Because they loved the other person. And it was so special. It was so real to them. In fact, on Thursday night, I mean, I remember when I didn't know that was there. And my kids said, swipe up, Dad. There it is. I went, how did it get there? And they said, Dad, you'll never understand that. Just use it. <laughs> did you know that's so much about our spiritual lives. God has designed an operating system that is unbelievable. In fact, you know what would have been even more interesting? I mean, you know, now you know, I'm thinking, because here I am in this, Bonnie and I are in this seat, and the Discovery Channel is going on behind me, you know, with the iPhone. Wouldn't it have been something if behind them, wearing jeans and a black turtleneck, I know he's not with us anymore, but can you imagine if Steve Jobs had leaned over the seat and said, do you want to know what else is in there? and had eagerly shown them the functionality of his little creation. But guess what? The one that designed us lives inside. And he says, he's leaning over the seat every day. And he's saying, can I show you what else I have built into what you are as a new creation in Christ? So that's what we're looking at. And if you were sitting at the uh, table with me, I would say, Open your Bible to Romans 5, and let me show you. Just, uh, this is just, uh, in fact, uh, my son works for a tech company, and, and for his training, they allowed him to briefly look at the operating system of this multi-billion dollar corporation, and he said it was unbelievable to watch that code streaming through as, as it was functioning. Did you know, when you're looking at Romans 5, you're looking at the code, only you're looking at God communicating to us the functionality of what he designed in Christ. So the first five verses, theologically speaking, would be called, if we were doing, you know, soteriology, it would be called the byproducts of, of justification. But actually, it's the operating system that God built into us. So uh, are you in Romans 5? Oh, three of you are. I, I thought you were seeing across the table from me. Are you in Romans 5? Okay, let's all stand. Now, we don't do that at the coffee shop, okay? It bothers people when you're standing up and reading across the table. We only do that when we're doing the group thing. But you follow along in your Bible, the first five verses, and I want you to especially notice that fifth verse because the operating system God designed is so beautifully portrayed there that the Holy Spirit pours out all this stuff into us and that's, that's Christianity, the way God designed it to be. So, Romans chapter 5, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And, and not only that, but we glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation pr uh, produces perseverance, and perseverance character, and character hope, Verse 5, now hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who is given to us. When we got saved, the operating system moved in, the Holy Spirit. He's the architect. He's the programmer. He is the, the battery that never runs out. You understand that? We're never out of range of the cell tower. We're constantly downloading. He wants to, look at verse 5, pour out these things into our heart. That's amazing. Let's bow before our Lord and invite him to teach us. Father in heaven, you have told us that the anointing that we have received teaches us all things. And so I pray that in our one-on-one, -on -one, which is one-on-hundreds, that the one-on-one -on -one would be you. 
the teacher, the author, the programmer yourself. Oh, dear Father, through your spirit, teach us about this operating system so that it becomes so natural to us that we can turn to someone and say, look, I have a flashlight. The Spirit of God guides me through life. I know right where I am. I I'm never in the dark. And it would be such a blessing if that person next to him would say, I didn't know I have a flashlight. How do I get that? And we, we share Christ. And we disciple one another. And I pray it would become as natural in our lives as believers, as members of your body, as parts of your church, as the two sweet people discipling each other in their flashlight were yesterday. And I pray that you, Spirit of God, would just uh, overflow our hearts today for your glory and for revealing Christ in us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And you may be seated. As you're seated, basically what I'm saying is the Holy Spirit is our new operating system. And these are the words. This is the code, the programming code. But I... I the seven byproducts are, are amazing. In fact, I highlighted them. Uh, let's see if uh, the highlight doesn't come out very well. But we've been justified. Remember soteriology? The byproducts of justification are, number one, peace with God. Number two, we have unlimited access by faith. Because without faith, it's impossible to please him. So we have to, by faith, come and, and partake, believing that, that in the account is everything God promised would be in there. In other words, uh, you know, the ATM card is given to us, the promise is made, the funds are there. We have to go and, and, and withdraw. That's what it means by faith. And then we have grace to stand, and we can only stand by the grace of God. We realize that what have we, uh, everything we have is not of ourselves. It was given to us. That's what grace is all about. It's what we don't deserve, what we can't do, what we couldn't accomplish. And so we stand in the grace of, of the imputed righteousness of Christ, and it causes us to have this rejoicing hope. Now, I, was, uh, I was challenged to pray for a friend of mine, a dear friend of mine, because they said, I have, a, I have a close friend who came to me and said, my life hasn't turned out the way I hoped it would. And I thought, how tragic. If they're a believer... Life, life is turning out far better than I hoped it would because I have ever, the best is yet ahead. It doesn't matter how much this clay pot wears out, cracks, and, and, and becomes inoperable because I am rejoicing in hope of what is yet to come. Did you know people that say my life isn't turning out like I hoped are sometimes facing the wrong direction? They're looking back at when they were young and had everything possible and, and every you know, desire, and they're looking back at that and what they need to, salvation actually turns us around and we're looking in a different direction. And we are actually saying, it's getting, like it says in Proverbs, that, the, that the, the, the new day dawns brighter and brighter every day for the righteous because we're looking toward, toward our heavenly city that has foundations and to the place prepared for us, which is far better than this place that we already know, if you've read Revelation, what's going to happen to it. So we're headed this way. Where does that come from? We rejoice, we're filled with joy because of hope. And where does that come from? It comes from knowing that, and then there's all this stuff, that hope does not disappoint. Why? Because it's connected to loving God, and that is poured out in our hearts, and all of this comes by our operating system, the Holy Spirit. So, peace with God. Do you have any lack of peace in your life? It's... it's it's not God's problem, it's ours. It's a connection. It's kind of like, uh, you know, Bonnie and I were somewhere on this trip, and she said to me, honey, how come you're getting Wi-Fi and I'm not? And I said, okay, here. I said, go to the little gear thing and hit that. And I said, and go to that page. Do you see? Your little green on is not. Push it. And it went green. She went, okay. You see, there, that is what discipleship in phone and spiritual life is all about. If you don't have peace with God, you can do a diagnostic. It, it's produced by the Holy Spirit. Let's trace where the connection isn't there. If you don't have access, if you don't understand what all is available, you need to connect to the Holy Spirit. If you are not standing uh, confidently in the grace of God and not a performance-based, you know, trying to make God happier by doing more, if you are not 
overflowingly rejoicing in hope and not despairing that life isn't turning out the way you want it, but you're rejoicing in hope of the glory of God. That's what you look forward to. And if you don't know that God's hope in you will never disappoint you, then his love is not being poured out because there's some, some lack of connection. And see, that's, that's the... And by the way, there's nothing wrong with turning your Wi-Fi and everything else off when you're on an airplane. It's just, you know, they tell you about 10 different things you're supposed to do. And you might forget you turned it off. And it's very much what discipleship is about, that, that we, some element of what these byproducts are, something in life has caused that to click off. And there's nothing wrong with sitting next to someone and saying, do you want me to show you again how I have peace with God? How I have access? how I know for sure and rejoice knowing that, that all of the struggles of life are turning out and I'll never be disappointed because I've invested my life with God. See, that's, that's the first century, early church we read about. It was as natural for them to talk about the byproducts of justification as it is for elderly people to discover a flashlight and help each other because the early church was experiencing this stuff and they wanted those that came to Christ not to miss any of the blessings and so that's that's what discipleship is is all about and and it's basically us taking the instruction manual and and understanding our operating system I mean, anything that you buy. I mean, you buy a car, here's all the features, you know? It's, it's got a cooler under the floor for all of you that commute, and you can put your food down there. Or, or it, you know, all the seats move out so you can move plywood in there. You know, I mean, it's just, I mean, you look at the features. You look at it, and you want to know, and you buy the, the system, you want to know how it operates and what it can, that's what the Bible, we need to use the scripture, the instruction manual to understand our operating system. And so, you and I have the most powerful operating system in the universe. The programmer himself lives within us. Our battery life is endless. Our system is constantly being updated, renewed, and synced. And, and what we need to do is to look at every day of understanding and inviting the programmer himself, the Spirit of God, to, to help us to, verse 1, Experience peace with God. Verse 2, access by faith of, of Romans 5, 2. Everything that he's, he's given us. Uh, verse 2 also, stand in his grace and rejoice. I mean, that it's, it's a discussion between us and the Lord. Well, what are the features of this new operating system? I mean, what all is... Do you know everything that the Lord has done? I mean, it's a lifelong pursuit. That's why... Uh, the more I read the Bible, the more I, I see and understand. You know, I'm a lifelong operating system student. Uh, I've collected the written works, 5,000, 4,500 of them, of people that have experienced the operating system in the scriptures that have gone before, and they've written down what they found. I listen, and you, you can too, to people. If you hear them talk about what they learned through their cancer, what they learned through their job loss, if it is all connected to the Lord, you're learning how the operating system works, how they, by faith, trusted the Lord and saw him uh, provide or open or change their, their whole attitude in this situation. Those are all features, but every feature is written down. That's the neat thing. Uh, it isn't like we have to go out in the desert, you know, and and hum and try and figure something new out. It's all, everything we need to know is written down. And we need to understand the features of our operating system. And so, here is what I was working at. And the reason it's not doing well, I think I spent too long listening to the couple behind me. And this is supposed to go cover to cover, so it's bigger. But I'll just run through it with you. These are, this is not exhaustive. This is a initial pneumatology of the book of Romans. You could do this with any book of the Bible. The Holy Spirit is from cover to cover. 
He shows up in Genesis 1, the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters, and he ends up still in Revelation 22, the Spirit and the bride say, come. So he is operative cover to cover. But just in Romans, we find in Romans 1, he is the witnessing spirit. He's the one that attests to the resurrection of Christ. He is the liberating spirit of God. In Romans 8, it says, the law of the spirit of life in Christ has set me free from the law of sin and death. Wow. You know, I remember I think in pictures, I will never forget seeing visually the, the miracle that, that spiritually happens when someone gets saved. Did you know, before we're saved, we are, we are, the gravity of sin is pushing us down. We are stuck to the earth. We can't get anywhere near God. We are just, mm. we are hopeless, separated from him. But the law of the spirit of life in Christ sets us free from the gravity that's holding us down and, and making us a prisoner to sin. I, I was speaking, in fact, I was teaching in uh, New Delhi, India. And I, I taught a whole week, and it was a Presbyterian school. It was huge and hundreds. It was wonderful and burned my mouth with all that uh, curry and everything. And... Um, got to know the bathroom well, and you know what I mean, if you've ever been to India, it's all those things. But uh, uh, finally, you know, they took me uh, to the airport. I was done speaking and, uh, and teaching, and, and I got a window seat. I don't like window seats. I like to be on the aisle, but I got a window seat, and so I was looking out. I couldn't believe it. Right out the window, I could see cows. I mean, they weren't further than that exit sign. Away. I thought, how do they? But you know, they let the cows run everywhere, and there was a fence, and they were chewing at the fence looking at me, and I was looking out a 747-400 Air India flight. If you know anything about Air India, they, they wait until everybody, every seat is filled. The plane might not leave for days, but every seat will be filled. Then it shakes. At, they bring fork trucks up, and any space available, they're pushing in the hold. Actually, the, the plane was shaking like this with them pushing. They were trying to get more stuff in there, and I thought, well, that's good, too. And uh, so I sat there, and finally, you know, the, the guys would say, put your seat in the most uncomfortable and upright condition, you know, and, and sit up, you know. And so we did, and he, we're going to take off. And so we got there, and, and that Air India pilot juiced those, those engines. Did you know a fully loaded 747-400 weighs 975,000 pounds? I think theirs weighed 976, but whatever. And we're there, and so he gunned it. And I looked out, you know, waved at the cow, and uh, we started going down that 9,200 feet it takes for a fully loaded 747 weighing almost a million pounds. You know, that thing has to get up to 235 miles an hour before the law of gravity is overwhelmed by the law of the aerodynamic lift of the structure of that plane. Well, we were, I mean, those engines were billowing, and I looked out the window, I could still see cows. And, and the plane was shaking. It was actually shaking like this, and the up compartments were shaking, and I thought, they put too many people on this thing, and there's still cows. And uh, I leaned and looked, and I could see cows that way. I knew we were getting near the end of the 9,000 feet, and, and I was watching for the people that sit up in the front always get the start of the ride, you know? The, the people that pay more, their end raises first if you're not going to crash. So I was looking toward the richer people, waiting for them to rise, and just at the end, as cows were looking at me from right there, you heard this... The, the metal actually strained, and the 975,000 pounds floated. Did you know I get to see that every time I share the gospel with someone and they have been filled and held to this earth by sin and you see the work of the Spirit of God that overcomes and the law of the Spirit of life in Christ right there sets me and you and them free from the law of sin and death. I mean, it's amazing, the liberation that the Spirit of God, and he, then when he gets us, he transforms us and teaches us how to use, as Romans 8, 5 through 8, and 12 through 13 say, roundup, spiritual roundup. Every time we see a weed of sin coming, you know, something from the old life coming back, we can mortify it, we can spray it. In fact, I have a friend here who is quite a gardener, and he missed his plants, and he grabbed the wrong mister. He grabbed his roundup, and boy, did he kill every one of his plants really well. And, but see, the lesson is this. It works. 
you don't have to say, well, that's just how I am, or I, this happened to me a long time ago, and I'm forever, you know, warped by this. No, no. The Spirit of God wants to transform us. That's the operating system, and he wants to mortify, and he brings life to us, quickening life. And he, there's the flashlight. You know how many people are stumbling through life as believers? And they, no one has sat beside them and showed them about the guiding spirit. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God, that, that he's, he will guide us. You just need someone to say, you swipe up. See, it's right there. Try it out. I'll show you. I'll show you how it works in my life, how I know I'm following in step with the Lord. And, and the encouraging spirit, um, by the way, the spirit's cover to cover. This is uh, 1 Samuel 30 and verse 6 where David, his whole family is captured by the Malachites and the town's burning. And you know what it says David did? He encouraged himself in the Lord. We can be encouraged anywhere. This operating system of the Spirit of God works anywhere. It works underwater. It works under duress. It works under stress. It works under anything. He can encourage us. And here is the assurance of salvation. You meet someone that's not assured, there is some connection to the Spirit of God that, that has a short in it, or there's no connection. He is the one that makes hope. The Spirit of God is the fountain of hope. It says, uh, you know, that, that he is the one that, that wells up. In fact, even here, it says the same thing in chapter 14. He's the one, we don't know how to pray, the Holy Spirit. You, for you know not how you ought to pray, uh, but the Spirit of God makes intercession with groanings that can't be uttered in Romans 8, 26. He's the one that teaches us how to be a living sacrifice. We don't even have to figure that out. Romans 12, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God. He is, the, by the way, the word I beseech, that's almost a word, a play on words. I beseech in Greek is parakleto. What is the Holy Spirit called by Jesus Christ? The paraclete, paraclete, the comforter. Even the beginning of Romans 12, 1 is, is a reminder that it's the Holy Spirit that leads us into sacrificing and presenting our bodies. He's the one that brings joy and gladness and hope. And he's the one, in fact, let's start there. You know, it's almost like, you're on the tour bus and they're describing the sight so much and you say, well, let us off, you know? So let's go to Romans 15, okay? Turn to the back and uh, we'll see how far we get before we run out of time. Uh, but Romans 15, and what I'd like to show you in, in Romans 15 is uh, explaining uh, God's plans for our spirit-empowered lives. And, and uh, that whole chart I just showed you, I'm gonna go through it backward. I'll start with the, the last one and, uh, oh, before I get there, I just, and this is just a, a, an aside, but did you know that the architect, the designer of the operating system lives within us? Did you know what else? Not only did God design the spiritual operating system we're supposed to live out every day, he designed us where he lives. Did you know every unchangeable part of your life is a reflection of God as our creator? That means God picked that I would be a man and not a woman. And God picked that I would be born to blue-collar workers, you know, in the, the late 20th century. Uh, and that I would grow up into 21st century America. And, and he chose my emotional makeup. He chose my physical makeup. He chose what I look like. Every part of my life he designed and every part of my unchangeableness, the, the parts of me I can't change, who I am, where I came from, what I look like, what abilities I have or don't have and weaknesses and strengths, all of that were designed by God. Now, think for a second. We live in a culture where people want to modify how they came out of the chute. They want to be different. We have men that deny that God made them a man and that God designed them as a man and that God planned for them to be a man and God only can fulfill his purposes in them the way he made them and they want to become a woman. And we have women. I mean, you guys read the news, you know, these six foot eight tennis players that, that are uh, now, you know, in the women's league instead of the men's. God designed, and every time we reject that, it's a rejection of God. And we're living in the most rejecting God 
time since the flood of Noah, where they're rejecting wholesale. I mean, God actually even designed that human beings be made in his image and that he grants life at conception, and we're rejecting that. We're rejecting his design for marriage. Even the church, so-called, who aren't reading the instruction manual, are saying that homosexuality is designed by God. It's not. It's a virus, and it's a deadly one. But God designed every facet of our lives, and the Spirit of God wants to empower. I'm going to go through these features, and every one I have are like parts of your phone. By the way, my sweet couple that was sitting behind me, they really got into it. One of them said, wow, Pandora, what's that? It started coming out. It was so loud. It was so neat and that they were, just, and, and they were just discovering the empowered features that they had. Now, what, what does the Lord want to do in our life? Well, number one, God's operating system he designed for us has spirit-empowered investments in God's account. When I grew up, my father was a good American. He fought in World War II. I uh, worked for General Motors for 46 years, and the, the savings bond person came through and told all the GM employees they ought to have a little taken out, support the country, help us get more in debt, you know, and save for your children's education or something. And so my dad had this every week taken out of his check, savings bonds, and our family used to go to the mailbox, and my dad would proudly pull out one of those $25 savings bonds and put it in where he put all of them, and that was saving for the future and the savings bonds, and they would double and all this stuff, and he'd use it someday for our college education, which they never did. They bought a car. But it's all right. He was still, he was involved in the investment program. I remember when I got here, I mean, uh, six and a half years ago, sat down with Mike Madison, and, and uh, you know, he's the investment counselor for all the staff and does everything, and so we sat down across the table, and he showed me his charts, and all the arrows were going up, 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 and I said, yes, and that, you need an investment advisor. Now, let's look at, look at Paul's investment advisor. Look at chapter 15. Verse 16, Paul summarizes his life. He says this, I have a spirit-empowered investment in God's account going on in my life. That's how I'm living. And he says that I might be a minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, ministering the gospel of God, that the offering of the Gentiles might be acceptable. Now, you can't really notice it in English, but if you would have been sitting in Rome getting this letter, you're... you're mind would have been triggered by the words Paul chose to use. That, that first one when he says that I might be a minister of Jesus Christ. You know, when you think of a minister, you probably think of a guy in a dark suit, you know, kind of a little bit, you know, you know just a typical minister. I mean, there's almost a stereotype what a minister looks like. That's not the word he uses. This was liturgos. There were eight different slaves in the Roman world of Paul's day. You know a lot of them, doulos, uh, bond slave, uh, diakonos, deacon, like a waiter. In the, in the ancient world, a deacon was a waiter. They kind of filled your water and everything um, as a slave. Uh, under rower, huperetes, you know all those. Liturgos was a slave that worked in a temple. And their whole life, they worked not in Jerusalem, in Apollo's temple, or in Zeus's temple, or in Aphrodite's temple, you know, wherever the, the temples were, there were slaves, and they just, they served the God. They were not freemen, they were slaves, and for their whole life, all they did is, you know, cut the wood, or clean the animal, or clean the, polish the idol. I mean, they just, and Paul, he says, I am a public religious servant. I am a slave of the true and living God. So that's how he starts. That's, that I might be a minister, I'm a slave of Jesus Christ uh, uh, in the temple. And by the way, that's a little reflection that he was the temple, Paul was, of the living God. And he knew it. He says, my body is the temple, so I am his slave. He bought me, and I want this temple to serve my God. Wow. Wow. We all are those slaves. But he doesn't stop there. He continues. Look at verse uh, 16, Romans 15, 16. Uh, a minister of Jesus Christ, the gospel, a temple slave, ministering the gospel of God. Now he uses another word. Uh, it's the word heterogouros. And, and hetero is the word in Greek for temple. Guras is, is uh, the, the working or the ministration of. And he says, I am a temple slave doing temple work. Wow. And what's your temple work, Paul? 
that the offering, the offering of the Gentiles might be acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. You know what he said my whole life is? He said my whole life is a partnership with the Spirit of God to invest my life for God. Now think about, we're designed with an automatic investment program already in place. It's kind of like Apple Pay, only goes to heaven. You know, it doesn't go to Macy's, you know, it goes to heaven. And, and we're designed with an automatic investment program. We're designed to share the gospel so God is glorified through saving people that we point to Christ. We're a, an instrument. And Paul here describes what he did for the Lord as sharing the gospel so people would get saved, so they can start becoming his offering of worship to the Lord. And so spirit-empowered investing means we start seeing the eternal benefit of being, participating, like my dad, with his little weekly um, deposit in those savings bonds. And we start seeing all of life being connected, that we want to, we want deducted from our time every week, our 168 hours, we want to sacrificially as a temple slave make our lives an investment for God. Now, what's interesting about that is if you do that, it starts impacting your life. Uh, all of a sudden we realize that Many of us are married. And so any part of our marriage that we have control over, we design it to be useful to God, not just profitable and comfortable to us. Did you know your marriage can be useful to God? I, I remember when, when I was dating Bonnie, I prayed for her for my whole life because my parents never got along, so I didn't want to be married. And so I said, Lord, don't let me marry the wrong one. So I dated over 700 different girls once. I did, honestly. I kept a list, so I'd never hit them twice, you know. <laughs> dated them once. And, and then I met Bonnie. I remember knocking on her door, you know. And she came to the door, and when that door opened like this, I, I, now this is not normal for you. But boy, I looked at her, and I said inside my head, you are who I prayed for my whole life. You are the one. I didn't tell her that till the next date. <laughs> and, uh, and as the words, remember, phonographic mind, I was thinking it, so I said it, and I looked at her and I said, you are who I prayed for for 27 years. You. And as the last word came out of my mouth, I thought, what a pickup line. She probably thinks I say that to all 700 of them, you know? And that's why they all ditch me. But, but what I decided is I would study what marriage is supposed to be, to be useful to God. If you're going to spend most of your life married, what, what does God say is the way you're supposed to design it? And you know what the Lord says? It says that our marriage is supposed to be a living advertisement for everybody that sees us of how Christ loves the church. And people should see our good works in our marriage. And when they see them, glorify God in heaven. When's the last time someone stopped and looked at you and said, yeah, I, your marriage is so different. What is it about you? You say, it's not me. I was born a selfish, rotten sinner. And you were too. Uh, but, you know, you don't tell them that right away. But, you know, it's true. And anything good is the Lord. And you design your marriage to be a, a reflection of Christ. You raise your children to be useful to God, not the world. I think a lot of parents have not got that figured out. They want, they push their kids to succeed, to, to, to go in every direction at the expense often of God. And they end up climbing the ladder and succeeding. And the ladder is leaning against the wrong building. And they're not pleasing God. They're, they, they've neglected and, and been deadened to the things of God in their mad pursuit of not, the primary goal is not to be useful to God. That's the first thing you decide. When you're picking a school, when you're picking a career, when you're picking something, how useful is that to God? Not to me or the world. To God. That's his investment program. We measure our jobs by whether or not they contribute to us being useful to God or whether they make us worldly and selfish, materialistic and lukewarm. 
It's not worth $50,000 more to be lukewarm and materialistic and, and far from God. And yet, who, who says that? When people say, pray, I've got a job opportunity over here. Do we pause and say, mm, wow, you get a bigger house, better car, more money for the kids. Is it going to make you worldly? Is it, what, how is this going to impact our spiritual life? See, that's, that's like those two people with the phone behind me. That's the level we have to be. And we start looking at our house, our purchases, all of our possessions. Do they help us reach the nations or do they hinder us? Are all those things we have like a giant anchor and, and they're holding us back? We could never go. We're too far in debt. They're school loans, you know? Did you know there's nothing wrong with, with having a non, you know, pompous title and not being in debt and having a comfortable... Do you remember when it used to be if you just had a house and a family and enough to eat and, you know, you were home some, that you were successful, and now you've got to have bigger and better and higher and be further in debt, and, and we have to start looking at that. And then, wow we begin to track our time usage and see whether it reflects a burden for serving God's desires, our own desires. Do you see why you do this in a coffee shop? Because it takes time to honestly look someone in the eye and to ask them those questions. And then you ask them, do you have spirit-empowered gladness? Do you know how to surrender yourself like Romans 12 says to do? How are your prayers? Is the Holy Spirit energizing your prayer life or is it mechanical? How about your hope? Do you live in hope or does life not turn out the way you thought it would and you're depressed about it? How about this? Are you assured? Do you know beyond a shadow of a doubt? Does the Spirit of God minister to your heart that you're a son and daughter of God? And how about your connectedness and closeness? Do you feel connected, that, that you are walking in step, united in the body. Uh, how about confidence in your direction in life? Uh, do, you, do you know he's guiding? Uh, how about the, the whole idea of, this is Hebrews uh, 7.16, we live after the power of an endless life. Yet we live like, like uh, we're scared to death, it's going to be over. Do you have a spirit-empowered life? Is God changing and transforming you and, and how? Uh, are you like the 747? Have you felt the power of being set free from the law of sin and death and liberated? And are you witnessing to that? Are you saying, hey, my flashlight works. Can I show you how yours can work? See, that's, that's what this, this whoop, list is all about. Whoop. My smart board's in a hurry. That's what Romans is about. And the Holy Spirit is our new operating system and that's what God wants us to be telling others of what he's doing in our life. Let's all stand for a closing word of prayer. As you stand, at the end of every service, we have godly men and women that stand here at the front. And if you need to know how to turn your spiritual flashlight on, they know how. That's why they're up here. If you aren't sure you have a spiritual birth certificate and you're not sure whether or not you're in God's family, they are certified uh, you know, OBGYN, they're midwives. They know how to get people, and they know whether or not you've been born again. They know from the scriptures. They can show you what the new birth looks like and, and show you how to be connected to the Lord. And you might not be even on that level. You might just say, I don't have that gladness. I don't have that joy. I don't have that peace. I don't feel connected. They know, and they come and share and say, yep, swipe up. See, that's how real spiritual life is. If, if you spend time reading the instruction manual, let's bow for a word of prayer. Father, I thank you that, that our lives can be a spiritual offering to you, that we can be your slaves walking around as your temples, that we can literally measure our life by how much we're contributing to that offering of souls that come to faith in Christ. Either we go ourselves or we help those go, either we speak ourselves or we hold the hands of those that speak, we either are the, the one that's out there doing it or we're teaching little ones to do it or watching little ones so others can teach them, but we're, we're a part of the process. And I pray that we would start looking at our operating system and talking to you, the designer, and saying, please, I want what you designed for me to be. 
I want to quit wishing I was something else or somewhere else or had something else. And I just want to be what you created me to be so that you'll be glorified and I'll be useful to you. And that's our prayer. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray. And all God's people said, amen. God bless you as you go.